For people with bipolar and other serious mental illnesses, having a crisis plan with the people that are close to you and are supporting you is really important. So I have Nick here today, which is my who is my biggest support in Minnesota right now because typically when I was in Illinois it would be my parents or like my family but here I have Nick so yeah and so I'm gonna go through a few questions that I read about in my training for my new job but I thought that it was really helpful to kind of talk about this with your support and I have the questions list and then also what to include in a crisis plan if something were to ever happen. For people with bipolar, it'd be mostly like a manic episode, but with anybody else who has like depression symptoms, it can be like anything such as like suicide um, risk people or like anything else where something serious can come up and you need help and support in the moment. So the first question I have for you is what events have happened in the past that caused you the most worry or concern? Your manic episodes when I am six hours away. When you were in Illinois and there was very little that I could do between needing to be at work and you being six hours away, it's not like a 30 minute drive, it was like, uh, I'd have to allocate well over a week's worth of time to try to actually be able to get to you. And so, actually, no, you were closer to seven hours away when you were at school. Yeah. Um, so that was probably one of the hardest situations for me from my perspective because I could not do what I know I needed to do. So like what specific things were happening that you wish you could have like been there or closer for? When you would have a manic episode, a lot of times you would you'd start off with a very few select symptoms that I could very easily read. And if I was there, I could have prevented you from having a full-blown manic episode, or I could have helped you before it got to the point where it did. And well, it may not have been it may not have worked the way that I hope it would have, I still believe that by keeping you on track... I feel like it lessened. definitely would have made a difference. It, it definitely yeah. would have, and yeah. it would have been able to at least somewhat lighten up the symptoms that you ended up experiencing. So are you talking about like the time, the second time I went to U of I and yes. like my computer broke and then yeah. I was like going out more and because yeah. I didn't have Dota anymore. Did, did you ever tell people that story? I, I think. I don't know if I went into the specific details, but we can now, basically, if you want to go through what you saw. Well, essentially, I noticed that when Cynthia was not sleeping or eating properly, she would start to be up later and later, which would then ultimately cause her to start not sleeping more and more and more. And also, when she would be going out, she would be going out and it would be later and later, she would be trying to join all these clubs. And when she would start getting manic, she would want to join even more of these clubs because she thought that it was a better idea to be involved in the community, which isn't inherently a bad thing. But it's when she lost her reason to go home, she just never wanted to. So essentially what happened is we were playing Dota one night. She elbow dropped her laptop on accident just because we were joking and laughing around. Yeah. And, and just, it was an accident and it killed her hard drive, so her laptop no longer functioned. And because of that, the one reason she had to stay home was now busted, and so she didn't feel like she needed to stay home, which ultimately led to her having one of the worst manic episodes I've ever seen. Well, at least out of you. But... Uh, yeah, I guess I've had pretty bad ones before that too, but... But that was the worst one that I saw. Yeah, because we weren't in contact. <sighs> Yeah. Well, and it was one of those things where I could tell what was going on. The only problem is I wasn't able to stop it because I wasn't mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I, okay. That is the thing. We've always been super far away, so we, like, weren't able to. And my parents did come that time, but at that point, I feel like it was a bit, li like, mm -hmm. I was already kind of 
far gone. Yeah. <laughs> By the time my mom came to go by that time. But in general, I feel like I was defying my parents because they were my parents. And so, like, and also when I'm manic, I tend to not want to listen to anything or anybody. So that just made it worse. But <laughs> that's the thing, though, is you do actually listen to me. I mean, yeah, but like if I'm that far, though, but say if you're that far, it may not make I a difference. Probably would not. <laughs> Fair. But I don't think it's gone like that far, person. And even like over the phone, it's hard because like I could do whatever, and I don't have to tell you over the phone. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the second question is. When does something become a crisis from your point of view, and what is the most dangerous part? When something becomes a crisis, now I'm using you as the example here, when you start getting detached from reality, that's when it really becomes a crisis. Because it's one thing that you're having trouble sleeping, and I need to help you go to sleep every night. It's not a big deal. Or when you start becoming extremely emotional about things. It's not a big deal. But when you start losing contact with reality and you start believing things that aren't real and they actually start affecting your life, I guess I should add that part. When it starts actually affecting your well-being and your life and the way you're actually living, mm -hmm. that's when it becomes a problem. Because, I mean, even for some of the little things you do, like... When you start to get slightly manic, you start to believe things like conspiracy theory stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. And honestly, I don't even see that as a problem. I mean, it's, it's when that starts you, happening, you know you the know, next part's happening soon. Yeah, and that's, that's again the thing, is when you start really becoming detached from reality. And when it becomes like, when it becomes a serious problem is when you lose full contact with reality. Like what you did at U of I. Mm -hmm. Because at that point in time, you had, you were almost consist consistently hallucinating everything, and every time you left the house, it got worse and worse and worse. It's weird because like, when I think back on it, I feel like what I saw and heard was still there, but mostly it was my interpretation of it. So I wouldn't say necessarily that I was, like, I, I feel like typically I don't hallucinate, I more have, like, really bad delusions. Kind of fair, fair. Yeah. I guess I could be interpreting your delusions as something else, but when you would say that you would be seeing things and that you would hear things and that things would happen when they weren't actually Wait, that's real. true, that's true. I do have, like, auditory hallucinations a lot more than like visual ones mm -hmm. so like the difference between hallucinations and delusions hallucinations is when you like actually feel like see hear taste feel something that isn't there and then delusions is more like your interpretation of your environment and like believing something is happening when it's not true true yeah. so i was just saying that for oh. everyone, but yeah yeah, I guess I guess I need to be more consistent when it comes to the terminology, but yes, you are correct. Okay. Um next question, what is a risk that you wish could be prevented? Well, one of the biggest risks is now being prevented with you being so much closer because when I'm so far away, I can't do much. Mm -hmm. But with you being so much closer now, you're at worst a 25-minute drive and if something were to happen, that's not a 25 minute drive. That's me sitting on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. So the biggest problem has been prevented from my perspective. Also, with you being here, we are like four blocks away from an ER. Mm -hmm. An ER and a clinic that is a part of the Mayo system. So we are literally within walking distance of very good medical help and that goes for both of us yeah i mean i feel like now my parents are feeling really anxious and nervous being so far away and not being yeah. able to do anything about it but i can see how like from your perspective 
Like, yeah. you're like, now I feel like I can be in more control of the situation if something were to happen. Yeah. And also, like, I would have to say, like, for me, like, I don't know if this is a risk necessarily, but when I lose sleep over things that I can't control, I feel like I'm typically good at getting to sleep on time and getting enough sleep. Yeah. But when something happens like that I can't control, it just messes with me a little and then like it can really trigger something. So And also I know this isn't necessarily like there might be correlation, there might be causation, but when it comes to you and your family or you and your dad and mom getting into arguments over things, I feel like that's where a lot of things start. Yeah, I definitely, like, have a lot of heated discussions with them. And I know I've talked about that in the past, but, like, I end up, like, internalizing a lot of things that they're saying and, like, thinking about it a lot for days following it happening and then it really affects my mental health and usually I'm able to pull through but sometimes it really like throws me for a loop and mm -hmm. I lose sleep over it or become depressed and like Thanks. either way like I could swing one way or the other depending on like mm -hmm. usually where I'm at at that when that happens and also like what happens Ooh. after. Well, and on top of that, when you become more depressed, you really start losing that desire to take care of yourself, to be eating, to be sleeping, to be actually taking care of yourself. Yeah, that, I mean, that happens in both ends of things, too, because when I'm manic, true, I'm, like, true. doing so many things, I don't think about mm -hmm. that. And then when I'm depressed, like... You don't want to do anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, and I understand. But... Yeah, I yeah. mean... Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. <laughs> well, and I know I've said this now, but with you being so much closer, there's a lot more control that we can have over the mm -hmm. situation. It's not perfect, but... Yeah, for sure. Um, what is the most difficult part of getting through a crisis? The first 72 hours. The first 72 hours is always the hardest because it's when you finally acknowledge that this crisis is happening and even if you took preventative steps to try to make it not happen but then when things kind of come off the rails that first 72 hours can be a lot of stress and frustration and emotions and just a lot of undesirable things happening. Mm -hmm. Are you talking but, about like, bef like right well, when it happens and before I really like realize that it's happening or like after I realize it's happening? After you realize it's happening. Like once everything kind of comes off the rails and it turns into a crisis, that's kind of what I'm referring to with that. Because mm -hmm. I mean, depending on the situation, and this goes for literally anybody, depending on the situation, it could be a matter of anxiety, depression, a manic episode. When you finally realize that things have gotten to a point where they are an actual, like, really bad problem, getting the help you need and starting on that track is always the hardest because you don't, you don't necessarily know exactly what you're gonna need to do or when you know what you need to do, sometimes you can't get it right away or sometimes Mm -hmm. It doesn't work right away, so it adds more stress and frustration and tension when it, it shouldn't have, but it does. So, maybe that's not exactly right with the way you had asked the question, but that's kind of the way my mind went when you asked okay. that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess, like, when... I, I'm not sure, like, what crisis means in this situation but like when i was reading through everything it sounded like a crisis was like an in the moment like out oh, like okay. something's happening at that very moment but i know like we kind of took this a different way but and it works 
but like I think that's what it was ha what what was that's what they were talking about sorry that's what they were talking about when they said what's the most difficult part of getting through it like if I were just like like, like an in the moment thing yeah like if I were like going on about some delusion and like really wanting to like act on whatever I was being delusional about sort of thing then and like yeah the, then the hardest thing in the moment would be just trying to have you accept that I'm trying to help you. Mm -hmm. And I guess that goes for a lot of people. And honestly, that actually goes for anything. It's like, if you've got people you trust, but in the moment they're like telling you you should do something that you don't really want to do, it's not because they're trying to make you feel bad, it's literally because they're trying to help you and it's not always easy to accept that help, especially when <laughs> Especially when your mind is just fighting you tooth and nail. Yeah. Like, so. when I'm medic, I'm not inclined to listen to a lot of things. Even, like, my own intuition when it comes to, like, this is not the way things are supposed to be or whatever. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so typically when, like, you create a crisis plan with your supports you want to kind of work on it together and usually you would do this with like a therapist too because they really know a lot of information but if you wanted to make one on your own basically if you included like you would include your information like basic information and your medication your triggers and or warning signs and your support and contact so anybody who's around you could like call your supports and whatever resources and coping strategies for yourself so like in the moment if something was happening you could like look at it right away and really know how to calm down in the moment by yourself even um because a lot of times like you're not thinking clearly when you're in that crisis stage so you really gotta have that reference there and then also ways to keep the environment safe and that's like for other people most of the time like if you know there's other people around it's a busy area like maybe like moving somewhere else or letting everybody know to like stand back a little bit or if there's anything dangerous in the area that you know would be bad for that mm -hmm. yeah and so you would typically make like a crisis plan when you're not in the crisis because like in the moment it's just not gonna yeah. work out I was like, yeah, making you gotta crisis. make it and plan ahead with mm -hmm. like your all the strategies and support that you have so yeah that's so everything that i have written down for this um i also wanted to include kind of update video and since Nick is here we can both talk about it but I started my job this last week and it was mostly trainings and like computer stuff so I don't know exactly what's going to be my job but I have like a better idea like I'm gonna be helping um, people with their treatment by like leading groups like group therapy and like helping them learn skills and then also doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to kind of figure out where they're at and also since it's a place that they live at i'm gonna also be preparing meals and stuff too then there's also the back end stuff of paperwork and like keeping everything up to date so there's there's always going to be that um so yeah that's what's going on with me right now the apartment is really nice and I'm I'm liking it so far. <laughs> There's still a lot of moving in to be done yet. Yeah. Um, I mean those boxes are empty mostly and I just keep them for storage, but like Yeah. But there's... like we don't have that much furniture here. Like I sit on the stools that we have now that my parents brought earlier this week or lie on my bed there's no other there's no in between really yeah no we we really need to make the apartment a little bit more homey 
I mean, especially if, if we're gonna have for the next, probably we're thinking like a year-ish. Yeah. Something like that. Or like, if I wanna get out of here before the winter, because Minnesota winter is gonna be bad, I've heard. I, there was a big, nope. there is a big snowstorm, or at least what I consider a big snowstorm. And then like, when I went out to eat, there was a waitress who said, oh, that's mild. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> yeah, in Minnesota, people don't realize it, but when you get whiteout conditions, you can't see past the hood of your car. When you get really bad conditions, like what we had earlier was... Yeah, I can still was, see pretty far, like, it was fine. It was yuck, and I wouldn't recommend traveling in it, but it's nothing compared to what we've had in the past. But granted, this year we've had such I a weird winter. I don't want to know what it's like. <laughs> I mean... If I can't get to work or I can't even leave my apartment, like, I don't know. I mean, that's what you just call a snow day. No, but people live there. I can't just not go. Yeah, that would be, that'd be interesting. I don't, don't know how the uh, company would end up working that out. But they probably have people a lot closer to for snow day yeah. problems. But the location I work at is typically short staffed too, and they're pulling people from that location to uh, work. So yeah, that kind of sucks. <laughs> um, but well, well, I, either we get out of there before then, or I will find out next winter. Well, and when it all comes down to it, probably by next winter at least I'll probably be moved in here officially. Mm -hmm. Not probably, I will be. <laughs> um, so depending Everything goes according to plan. Knock on wood. That is wood. <laughs> you sometimes knock on things that aren't wood and I'm like... Knock on wood. I would walk at you. Alright, whatever. Um, so, yeah, once, once the apartment gets a little bit more moved into and gets a little bit more comfy and it'll be a little bit nicer, right now it doesn't feel... It kind of feels more like a hotel room than an actual apartment. Yeah, I feel that. But once... Once EV gets rebuilt, which will hopefully be today, no. hopefully. No. Okay, fair. No, um, you're you're probably gonna stay here for a good portion of the day, and you won't have time. You work tomorrow, right? Yep, so. and I'm gonna end up meeting with my dad tomorrow. Okay. That'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, once we once we get our computer set up, and once we kind of get this place a little bit more comfortable to be in. I feel like this place will really turn into a nice little home, but that'll, that'll take a little I was just time. thinking like maybe we won't have, like add too many things because then it'd be it, hard. Like we don't really need a couch or anything Well, like I'm, I'm not talking a couch, I'm talking a couple of comfortable chairs we can sit in. Like yeah, at least here. Because yes. this is probably going to be like a That's computer area, spot, yeah. so we'll need better chairs for that. But Well, we have chairs, we just need to bring them. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I also want to get a um, a mat for the floor here, so we're not scuffing up the floor. True. Or we could just get not wheelie chairs. You like a wheelie chair? Oh, we should get a mat. I mean, again, actually, that's what we could do today. We could go down to like stables and stuff and start looking for furniture. Yeah, I definitely need to like get some things. Yeah. At least you have food. We also need to go grocery shopping. Yes. Which always goes bad when I'm around because it's just like, ooh, I have money. And that looks good. And I'm a child, so. <laughs> yeah, 26 and I still shop like I'm a kid. I do that. I mean, hey, but when there's a big bag of french fries and a big bag of hot wings, can you really blame us? <laughs> It's like the food thing. I don't even know why the french fries though. Okay, Arby's curly fries in the bag is actually pretty solid. Yeah, I like those curly fries. Dang, we need to get some of those. We're gonna pick up fries today? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Then I need a way to cook the fries too. That's literally either we're gonna, if we don't find one at the grocery store, then I'm gonna just go and steal one from my house. Okay. I, I'd already planned for that. All right. I was actually gonna steal one before I came here, but. Well, yeah. I'm going to end this video and I will see you all next week. See ya.